I'm, my name's Cassandra Pixie. I'm the education manager. So James Kramer and I work very closely together, and so we're brainstorming and thinking of wonderful things for you to engage with next year. So we hope we'll see you back um, next year. But this evening, um, we want to thank our sponsors, the National Endowment for the Arts, the Indiana Arts Commission, the Arts Council of Indianapolis, Nuvo, WFYI, and Wish TV Channel 8. Our conversation was selected also to be a part of the Butler Arts Fest. This is the festival of the work of our students here at the university in the Jordan College. Many of those events will be taking place in the Schrott Center next door, but Cinderella, the ballet, which I, I think is the finale for that arts festival, will be right here on this very stage in a couple of weeks. So um, April 3rd through the 13th is the, the front part of the arts fest, and then the 25th through the 27th is the encore, with that includes the Cinderella ballet. And the, the theme this year is fables, fairy tales, and physics. So you're gonna get to see a, a little bit of all of that tonight. Um, I want to welcome James Kramer, our Community Relations Manager. A lot of you who have come to these events before know James in his other hat, his other role, but what you may not have realized is James is a graduate of Butler University with a degree in dance and his professional performing career spans over three decades and over 20 years. He's taught many dance styles, he's choreographed, he's designed sets and costumes, and he's run his own dance company. And we're gonna have a question and answer session at the end. We're gonna get you up on your feet if you so choose to. This is a really interactive event and you're gonna leave here with a whole new knowledge about the art form. So we're so glad you're here this evening and we'll be about an hour. We'll have the question and answer at the end. So James, take it away. Thank you. Thank you, Cassandra. Okay, so Ballet 101. We did this a few years ago when the Joffrey Ballet was uh, coming in anticipation of that because we find that a lot of people have uh, a lot of questions about what ballet is. What, what does it mean? What are they doing? Uh, what should I be prepared for? How should I dress? Why are they dressed the way they are? A variety of different things. So we're going to be doing um, hopefully covering a lot of those questions, and as Cassandra said, we'll have some time at the end for, for that as well. Mention too that we are filming tonight, so that those of you that are here tonight would like to review it, or if you want to tell your friends about some of our programming, you can go to our website, Clues On Demand, now has a lot of our recorded uh, lectures, uh, conversations, invitations to performances, a variety of different things that we've recorded over, um, uh, over the course of this year, and certainly in, in previous years too, we have some archival things there as well. So we really want you to, to know that you can revisit and share that with other people because we really feel that you all are here and engaged and there's probably some other folks that you know that would like to uh, participate in something like this, may not really know what it's about, maybe not sure if they want to make the trip out to Clues to check it out. You can give them that little bit of a commercial message, if you will, and help us help be our ambassadors, help us uh, explore that. Um, so that really really helps. And then as I say, we had uh, some folks that were unable to come this evening, so they'll be able to check, check out and see what they missed. So, what is ballet? Uh, ballet is, is such a, a broad term, but we're really gonna try to focus on this in more of a historical context, in that um, it was a, it's a formalized form of dance uh, with its origins in the Italian Renaissance court of the 15th and 16th centuries. Uh, it spread from Italy to France with the help of Catherine de' Medici, uh, where ballet developed even further under her aristocratic influence. So that pretty much sets us up in a time period, and it sets us up in a location in the world, and it sets us up in a certain um, hierarchy. Ballet is not folk dance. It has a structure to it. Again, it, it was uh, de' Medici that for her wedding wanted to present uh, a royal court display that people could participate in but they could also then observe and watch and be entertained. Uh, it was certainly dance was a portion of that but they were court dances um, and they were done by the courtiers and those people who had dance training, formal dance training, not necessarily the, the lower classes or the peasants who would have been doing just folk dances that they, that they learned from one another. These were folks that, who had uh, studied and had uh, dancing masters and people that trained them just like uh, we were uh, with uh, Louis XIV 
uh, had daily ballet classes that followed his horse riding lessons. So we're you know, getting our heads into a period and a place where people would have uh, these wonderful amenities, many of which we all can enjoy now on a much more uh, available, common day-to-day uh, -day type of basis. But it has that kind of foundation, a, t a period in time where not everyone was, uh, had the access to this kind of uh, art that we now call it as, a, um, as an experience in their lives. So they have now moved to France. France has embraced this. France is the cultural center. It is the, the uh, epitome of what other uh, countries are trying to emulate. So at this period in time, uh, Louis XIV, now into the uh, 17th century, is really coming up with a school of uh, ballet with a codified um, uh, way of teaching and a formalized structure, the, fifth, the five positions that we still refer to today, five basic arm positions, five basic feet positions that all dance uh, movement stems from is still utilized today. Um, so that is a good foundation that we've been dealing with for hundreds of years. But you start seeing um, the, the court dance becoming more and more um, about the entertainment for others. So then it starts becoming more of a trained dancer that then presents to the court. It's less about the courtiers dancing and more about them sitting and being entertained as time goes on. So we see that. Um, it has certainly gone from there into a variety of things. And I think that um, though there are some purists, um, uh, I know a friend of mine who's this really staunch ballet domain that feels very strongly that it has to be a classical ballet for it to be considered a ballet, for it to be of any quality. Uh, um, it, he, he has some, some pet names for New York City Ballet and Twyla Tharp and other dance companies and art forms that, that you have ballet as a, as a strong basis. But, um, but he's a bit of a snob, if you will, and, and <laughs> quite honestly. And, and I have to say that for a long time, I was kind of on that same, same boat with him and realize that it really is um, something that when you look historically, has, has it continued to evolve. It has continued to evolve and reflect what is going on in the culture and the time. And as we still do today, one generation takes that foundation and develops it into the next of what they want to put it into. Uh, again, we, we're saying it, it came from a court dance into a school, so now we actually have trained dancers who were going to become professional dancers, who were going to become entertainers, to then go back and then, uh, as I say, entertain the court, and then eventually becoming uh, entertainment for the masses. Uh, some of the things that, that go into the ballet, as we're talking about the, the, the school and the training and the positions and things like this, We'll get up and get to try some of these things throughout the evening, but you have five basic foot positions, and that is as much to help an ease of movement laterally and um, uh, up and down the stage space as it is for the aesthetic. Um, dance, especially as the classical ballet is developing, is about showing the body and its movement. So you, um, we, we kind of mix a lot of different things in here in our time periods, but while we're talking about the um, the positions of the body, we're talking about being able to see the body. So the costumes have to reflect that. Um, we've got a rack of costumes here, some of which are on loan from Butler Ballet, um, some of which you'll see in the upcoming production of Cinderella. But I wanted to show you some of the things, what is traditionally thought of as, as the, a ballet tutu. This is what we call a romantic tutu, which really was shocking in its time because it shortened the, dr dr the dresses for the women to a point where you could see their ankles. And that, again, you know, when you're talking about that is not seen, you don't see except maybe a tip of the shoe, you never see a, a woman's leg to then be able to shorten the dress so that it, again, it creates mobility. Um, it's oftentimes been thought of that this was an undergarment originally, that they were, that they were such lightweight um, uh, net and tool that it would have supported the overskirts. And as you're trying to free the body so that it can move and so we can actually see more of the body working, we want to shorten the costumes. We want the costumes to be lightweight enough that you can actually start doing more and more challenging movement. Again, the following generation is going to want to take and test that and see how much more we can do with the art form than the last generation did. Um, you know, we don't want to have some stodgy old things that our parents had. We have to have something new and fresh. Um, but you'll also see that, again, the, uh, 
a reflection to the, the court costumes you see here. And this happens to be one of the court costumes in Cinderella coming up. But you, you can imagine a, a gentleman wearing this with knickers uh, or something that was at least knee length in pants. And then you gradually start losing those to, to reveal the musculature of the body. And I think it parallels in science. And sometimes I even think leads us in culture. Uh, certainly, we see things in the, in the last century where people were very influenced by the ballet russe. Jumping, jumping ahead a few hundred years here, but the idea that what they would bring into the theater became the rage in fashion, the, the whole sense of the oriental and the whole sense of the exotic, what they would bring in their productions was seen then in fashions uh, and in interior designs from the set designs of Leon Bosque and, and uh, Picasso and Matisse to then take those into the houses. So I think it, the, the which comes first is, is debatable, but the fact that they're, they're really influential in people's lives, what's going on with the dance and the art forms. So costumes, again, are shortening up, fashion follows suit, and you gradually have more and more mobile, more, mo more and more mobility in, in movement. Um, likewise, the, the corseted, the boned corsets for women uh, that we see through several centuries uh, are still used to a certain degree, even in contemporary costuming. Uh, not so much with, with um, a traditional line of that, to keep it shape, to keep it, give, it, give it a certain form and structure. But yet, at the same time, you have to have a certain flexibility in there to do some of the uh, dance things that we do. Um, so class is something that's done uh, every day for dancers, uh, maybe one day off a week, maybe two if you're really pushing it. Uh, it's hard to take a break because you don't want to lose momentum. You know, we've all seen those... Uh, uh, and heard about the, you know, the body that stays in motion. Uh, if you stop, it's really hard to come back. So you usually don't, and you work through injuries, and you do a lot of that. But it is a matter of trying to keep the body in condition, to try to keep the muscles uh, toned and developed and stronger and, and, and pushing those limits. Clearly, what was done in court dances um, is, is much easier in some forms than what we do now with ballet, but that's because we have pushed and, and developed and the shapes of bodies have shifted and changed because of, because of the, um, I think, the understanding of the body and its capabilities. So that uh, certainly has evolved over time. But class is, uh, starts at a bar uh, so that you do your basic stabilizing exercises, working your core, working your balance, checking your balance, standing on one foot, using this as your guide, as your, as your handrail, as your um, um, uh, support, if you will. Not to hang on to it and rely on it, but to use it just to check your balance at any time. And if, I'm sure, you know, we've all been in the gym or, or maybe in, in gone through some physical therapy or know some folks who have. To your, when you're trying to do that, uh, you're trying to be able to basically find where your balance is. And that's true in a physical way, but it's also trying to balance um, balance your, your being. Um, you're trying to balance your mind and the music and, and your, your learning combinations and things. So it's a really a balance of the whole and trying to do more than just stand on one leg. Uh, a lot of exercises will do that, but there's not a lot of, of artistry or there's not a lot of opportunity to integrate that into other, other um, moments. After bar, then we come to a center and we do then a, a usually a slower section where you're now the first time off the bar. It's just like taking the training wheels off the bike or first time all out and off of the, the support. Uh, you, you now really test what you've just done at the bar for possibly a half an hour, maybe 40 minutes to an hour of bar work. Now you come center and you take and do those same exercises, modify to do them without the bar, and then gradually working up to the point where you're working in jumps and uh, leaps across the floor so that it goes through a gradual progression. Um, very often we have students, especially because bar work uh, for some who, especially when they come to dance early on, they like to do movement. They were put into dance class because they were just jumping all over the house. People, you hear them say that all the time. That they, were, they were introduced to ballet because they couldn't sit still. And then we take them into class and we make them stand at a bar for half an hour. Kind of counterintuitive, but the point of that is to learn there's a structure, there's a discipline, there's a gradual progression. Sometimes I've had students who've wanted to skip bar and just go right to center and just the big jumps, and you might do that naturally. Again, it's going from that natural movement into something that's structured and defined and has a certain uh, technique base to it, 
um, a school of thought, a school of, of um, study that goes with it. And as you can imagine, the schools of study vary from culture to culture. We talked about uh, dance starting or the ballet starting in Italy. Cicchetti and the Italian school is a very different type of approach than the French school, which is probably now uh, considered the oldest school of, of uh, and training in the French school, the Paris Opera Ballet. But then also uh, Russian school with Vaganova, uh, English methods, uh, American school of ballet with the George Balanchine type of, of technique. Other schools are continuing to evolve and develop. And just because we're living that history doesn't mean that it's not going to be in the future yet another codified school of Australian ballet or South American ballet or various other places around the world that are doing it, a lot in, a lot in the, uh, Asia. Um, a variety of different areas of the world have their own version of and their own school of. Um, always trying to improve upon, always trying to take and blend between the, the advances in what the body is capable of. Uh, extension, for one, is, is a, a big thing that has, has evolved over time. <coughs> So taking that and, and building upon that and how to keep the artistry to it. Uh, a lot of people feel that we're sort of in that transition between it being a spectacle and being almost a circus acrobatic contortionist type of trick and where's the artistry in that. And that's, that's been coming on for some time as, again, costuming changed. Was it because the body had changed or the body changed because the costume allowed it? I think it, uh, again, goes, goes hand in hand where you see that the body is more capable of raising its leg. Clearly, if you weren't to see the woman's ankle or to see the man beyond, beyond the pants, to now take the leg above 45 or above 90 degrees to be able to see the body moving through space, um, it comes with strength, it comes with the freedom. You then have to say, well, we have to, we have to make this, uh, this costume even more flexible. Uh, so that leads us into what, we, what dancers tend to wear on a day-to-day -day basis when you're not in costume. And again, these costumes were the period dress. They were dressed up, certainly, but, they, but those were their costumes. They didn't go out and create something of a different era. They even modified something that was uh, looking in the silhouette like it was still something they could wear to court, almost to be a, a, a different character with a mask or a headdress or something like that that might turn them into, in Louis's case, the Sun King. Um, so he had this gilded costume that all of his courtiers had to bow to because he, he brought in the sun and then hence his, his name from then on, from the time he was about 13 or 14, was the Sun King. Um, so um, hence we should have Sun King Brewery here doing a little sponsorship. <laughs> Maybe we could give them a little plug. But that idea that, that that was his character in that ballet, but he was still in a modified dress of the day. Uh, it wasn't something, something uh, extremely different from that. Um, but in the classroom, again, nowadays, what we would wear is, is a soft ballet slipper, so that gives you a little bit of traction, not, not bare feet, and not something that's too much heavier with a heel or, uh, or, or a heavy sole that would, would stick. You want to have the right kind of traction. That's extremely important so that you can move across the floor and in and around. But um, in addition to the ballet slippers, then it's something that's very easy to move in. Uh, some of you may have, uh, well, clearly and hopefully in the in advertisements you saw to come, dress comfortably so you could move. But when we get into a real dance class, we gradually shed the layers of sweatpants and leg warmers and sweat uh, sweatshirts down to as the bare minimum so that you're in a, as tight fitting a clothing as possible. And I uh, very often get the questions like, why do we, you know, why do dancers dress in as funny outfits? Well, I think uh, you've got football uniforms. Okay, those are fairly tight fitting. It's padding. You take the paddings off and you tighten it up. It's it's a pretty tight fitting costume or uniform. I have to be careful. Those are uniforms. These are costumes. Um, but they, you know, again, you've got swimmers, uh, runners. Um, everybody has a different kind of 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 uniform. If you're a fireman, you're every, people have uniforms that they wear to work. Uh, you know, that have shifted and changed from a suit and tie or a dress to now be able to wear slacks or, or jeans to work. Um, so that is, has shifted. With, with dance, it's more and more of a, a stretchy type fabric that you can move in and that it, it fits the body well so that it keeps the warmth in because you're trying to warm your muscles up and strengthen them. And you have to go through this whole bar process, not just for the stability, but for the warming up of the muscles. So extremely important that your clothing allows that and the environment in which you are it allows you to warm up. Dancers are very sensitive to the temperature, and um, so we want to make sure that you're, you're warming up the body. 
and that it, it also is not in the way when somebody's trying to teach you. Uh, and again, why we have so many classes is because it's a constant effort. Uh, it's, it was described as uh, when a musician is playing, they can hear what they're needing to do. They can adjust that. When you're dancing, it's, you can't always look at yourself in the mirror to see what you need to fix. You need to have an, a, a third, uh, you know, another person there to teach you to gradually shape the body into the line that is ideal. Uh, and that ideal varies from culture to culture as well. But, but uh, again, some people think that 90 degree extension, uh, a right angle to the hip, is, is as far as it should go. And back in the day, my, one of my artistic directors felt that was the artistic aesthetic for men. Their legs should not go above 90 because that was what he was taught. And so we, we never worked on our extension to go above 90. We never worked on trying to get our you know, flexibility up by our ear or anything like that. That, again, the aesthetic changes, the sensibility changes. People come in with maybe some other flexibility. We, we um, were able to hire a dancer in from China at one time, and he had trained, and he was just extremely flexible. So that then changed our sensibility to what was acceptable, so the men could start lifting their legs a little bit higher and, and stretch more and gain more flexibility, as well as the strength in there. So dance attire is, is a real practical reason you know, why we have that. And, and so you don't have a lot of extra stuff. I mean, I wouldn't wear this kind of a jacket, except maybe for a, an exercise or two until I, got, until I started sweating, maybe. And that's very important so that you feel the body is warmed up. Um, tonight I'm keeping it on just so that I can keep my mic on, but we'll, we'll see that. Um, so um, again, they take a lot of classes because they need to do that for strengthening. And then for a dancer, after the, an hour, maybe hour and a half class, uh, could be even up to two hour class for strengthening, for, for getting the body ready, then you spend a day rehearsing um, and then go into performances. Uh, almost always have to have at least a half an hour of warm up. Uh, whether you're doing a class for strengthening or whether you're just warming yourself up for a performance, which are two different kinds of things, you're going through a basic warming up of the body and the muscles. Um, I wanted to show you some of the things that dancers wear. And these are actually a couple of, uh, it's a pair of point shoes uh, with the ribbons on it. This one uh, has a little bit of elastic here as well that helps hold that onto the foot. And this is what uh, ladies have developed now since probably the early 18, maybe like 1820s, 1830s, when, the, when uh, someone, again, advancements in technology, somebody says, well, I need to look more uh, like a sylph, more like a spirit, more lightweight, more ideally, ideally feminine, so that they're lightweight, effortless, in, in the point you allowed them to give that illusion of floating. Uh, moving this with a dress uh, or a skirt of, of a, a ankle length allowed them to look uh, very much like spirits and butterflies and other types of things. It was very lightweight. So then when they did get lifted by a man, it would be effortless. Even if there was effort, it would appear effortless. So we've got some point shoes here, and I wanted to just kind of pass these around, but I, then following that up, I'm going to show you a couple of the insides of them. And Jimmy, you helped me do this a few years ago, didn't you? We put this on the bandsaw, and we took a point shoe, and we cut it down the middle so that you can actually see the insides of point shoes. People oftentimes think, because they are uh, somewhat noisy sometimes, and people think they're tap shoes, or people think that they're, they're wood. Um, they're actually layers of, of compressed paper so that they've created a very solid, um, solid inner core here. And you can see this is, you know, it's coming across. A lot of times, and again, it's the individual dancer. The purpose of them is to create a support around the toes so that the strength of the dancer is to be able to lift themselves up onto the tips of their toes without support. That's the ideal. So that's why you really don't have a dancer that goes on point really before their bones and their, their muscles have developed enough strength to take them up there. But you can't hold that for very long. Just like a jump, you can jump in the air, but for how long? A dancer who has a partner can sustain them there longer, can lift them up and carry them across the whole stage without ever letting their feet touch. You can't do that on your own. Likewise, you can't go up on your own toes for any length of time and do a dance. You have to have something that wraps around it. So early on, they started wrapping different things around, came up with this configuration, and each of these are handmade. 
um, and they last a ver various lengths of time, but none of those are very long. Um, sometimes these shoes might last a performance. These shoes run uh, close to $80 or more, um, and they get very, very, uh, now, after you've used it and they're broken down, because they are made of glue and paper and fabric, and you want them to be broken in so they're soft, just like a new pair of shoes. Again, most of what we're talking about tonight is very relatable to, to everyday life. You don't want to put on a brand new pair of shoes and go dancing. You want to put on a brand new pair of shoes and go walking somewhere. You want to break them in. So the same sort of thing, you break in a pair of point shoes, there's no going back, as we know. Once you've broken it in, you can't make it harder to, too easily. There are a variety of things that, that women will do to try that, whether it's future floor wax, baking them, pouring jet glue into them, a variety of things that you can do to try to lengthen it. Someone came up years ago with a fiberglass point shoe that, um, that was really strong, but it doesn't give a, enough for the dancer's foot to really be a practical thing that, that works um, too well. Uh, so they're still made, but, they're, but it, it wasn't the, the miracle shoe that we all thought it would be years ago. They were like, oh my gosh, we'll, we'll never have to have a new point shoe. You could have fiberglass that last forever. The, the satin would wear out before the shoe would break down. Um, but it, was, it, it needs to have that kind of flexibility. So we still have makers. Uh, certain dancers have favorite makers, just like you may have a favorite. Um, certain clothing that you wear, you know fits you better with a certain designer. I mean, Levi jeans don't work for me. Wranglers are great. You know, a certain type of shoe might work for me, but not another. Same thing with the dancers and their, their shoes. They have a cobbler that sits and makes each of those shoes. Uh, many, many hours it takes to put them together and very little time it takes to tear them down and destroy them. Um, that also is one of the things with, and we'll, we can get up here and show you here toward the back. Um, thank you. Um, we can bring us back here in the back. If people want to come back here and see some of the flooring that we have back here as a sample. Um, we've got two things that, that help us. We've got what we call a Lier floor, and that is a, a, a sprung floor. It has a little cushion to it. It's a, a panel of that right now that we will cover this entire stage in a few weeks with. It interlocks the tongue and groove system, and then it has two panels. There's a, a bottom piece and the top piece, and in between, there's, there's some material that allows it to have a little bit of cushion, and you can probably see that as I step on it and jump. There's a little bit more cushion than you would have out here on this harder surface. But likewise, once you start putting something very firm and solid on a hollow surface, what do you get? You get something that sounds It's really hard not to be dancing on this and, and not make a sound. It's really hard. So very often, even though they're going to look lightweight and effortless and, and uh, as if they're floating, you're probably going to hear something. So it's, it, but we put on top of that a surface that allows it to deaden it a little bit. So this, this goes over this. This gives you the softer cushion. This gives you the even surface and traction so that you're not going to be as, I, I'm sure somebody was out this winter and probably hit a patch of ice. You don't want to have that when you're on stage dancing. You don't want to slip. You don't want it to hit some place where you're trying to turn and the floor is really, really sticky and you can't turn without hurting yourself. Same sort of thing here. Basketball courts, slick. You have to have sneakers on it to give you some traction. You hear the squeaking, you hear all of that. Dance floor, this gives you an even surface. It may seem a little slick, it may seem a little sticky. It's a personal preference. Generally, when this warms up under the stage lights, it gets a little bit more pliable. Um, it rolls out so that we can lay it where we need to, and that means that when you run off stage, you're not going to hit a slick spot and keep sliding. You're going to continue running on this for a little bit until you can get your bearings of where you're going when you go off stage. But this gives us the, the surface, gives us the, the traction. So between these two, we now have that floor. Back in my day, this is the floor we danced on here. We didn't have layer floor. That came a few, you know, a few decades later. And then this floor, you know, on top of it, marley floor we would have. And so very often that we'll still have this marley floor on top of, of without the layer floor. Um, Motion was House was here a few weeks ago. I don't know if any of you saw Motion House. They have a, a, a dance floor, but they're not on top of this. Um, but Many, many companies will, will dance on something like this. This is what we have in our studios now so that we can have that kind of a, a, a cushion. What it does, it allows us to jump a little bit higher. It doesn't give us that spring like a springboard in gymnastics or a trampoline would or a diving board would, 
but it gives us something that, that allows our muscles to be um, worked and pushed a little bit further than they would if you were just on a harder surface wearing out. I mean, any of you stand on concrete, you know it's very tiring. So when you have a more a softer surface, then it can be too soft too, like a, like a gymnastics mat could be almost too soft. So it's just the right for, for most dance. So this is what we have as our substructure. I'm going to show you something over here, though, on TV. We can come back and have a seat. I'm going to turn on our monitor here because I wanted to um, show you a couple things. Since we've seen the shoes and what goes into it, um, I have here queued up a scene from Black Swan. I don't know if anybody saw Black Swan. It was out a few years ago. But this is a scene where she's prepping her shoes to, to get her point shoes um, ready to go into class and rehearsals then. And, um, it gives you in just a real short period of time a, a, a glimpse of how that happens. Um, and then it's followed up right, that, right after that with, with uh, a scene of them taking class in uh, what's more like a, if, if this, it, it could be a studio theater, but I think it's more a studio that has uh, um, stadium seating in it so you can watch the rehearsal or you can have visitors come in and observe the process as, as, as often uh, the case with larger companies where you're I'm constantly bringing folks in. So let's see what we've got here. Let's see. So she just spent eighty dollars to tear her shoes up. That's it's like trying to soften them up having to sew on her own ribbons and sew on her own elastic and the way she prepares her feet and ta tapes her toes and, and then really scores the bottom of that so it gets a, tr a little bit more traction. Sprays it down so it really tightens and fits, uh, uh, you know, really is gonna form to her foot. At that point, they have to take off all of their junk, all of their warm-ups and stuff, because the director's coming in. He's going to cast the ballets from that. So he wants to see, see the body. He wants to see the body that he's going to be creating this new Swan Lake production on. Um, so women dance on point. Men do. They have, uh, but not usual. Uh, that Frederick Ashton has a Midsummer Night's Dream, so when Bottom turns into the donkey, it looks like hooves, so there's a character work there. Some contemporary choreographers put everybody on point, uh, or you know, put the women barefoot and the men on point for a specific character type thing. Mark Morris has a production of Nutcracker, or the, the Hard Nut, I think is what it's called, that, um, that utilizes that for a special effect type of thing. Um, when I was at school, I took point class just to strengthen my feet, because it, as you can imagine, it really does work your whole foot when you have to lift yourself up to the tips of your feet. The legs, the feet, it, it was really for a strengthening. And also, it can help, uh, help stretch and shape the foot so that because you're putting your weight up and over the tips of your toes, that gives you a lot of, of uh, uh, room in which you can stretch your foot to get to that position. So men don't usually do it on a day-to-day -day basis. The Ballet Trocadero they do. There are other uh, ballet companies where they might uh, incorporate it for a special effect, though. Um, so as a, and it's true that it is right on the tip of your toe uh, that they are going up to, that that shoe is helping you support on to roll up to that point in that degree. Um, so French is mostly what our language is. That creates a common, uh, common language. So that through the movement, we, uh, it's, it's almost like if, if we were having this conversation in China, you could probably still follow along because we would be using French terminology. Uh, same sort of thing in, in really anywhere in the world. And with, uh, when Ballet International was here and we had truly an international company of dancers from Azerbaijan and Russia and Ukraine and Panama and China and as well as America, 
the, the common language there, would, and quite honestly, a lot, of the, a lot of the folks who had just come to Indianapolis had very little English, but we could communicate and create the productions because we had the common language of uh, French as our basis for the, for the uh, terminology and the dance steps so that people would understand that in whatever their native language was, that the, the language of France. And again, that's back to because of Louis XIV having this, this school uh, this a form of training and that being the center at that time, the rest of the world was emulating that. And if France had it, we wanted to have it too in Denmark as well as in, in uh, Italy and Russia and, and in England as well and then eventually America. Um, female dancers, very often, uh, especially with, in ballet, we, we call them ballerinas. Technically, that, that term is, is traditionally reserved for a higher st status, a developed dancer of, uh, um, uh, tr of training, of maturity. Um, in Russian school, you have the, the chora phase, or that lower entry level, and then they work their way on up through soloist and principals, and then into ballerina, and uh, ultimately to a prima ballerina, or prima ballerina assoluta, which would be the best of the, of the best in the world, and there are very few of those. Uh, someone asked me, how, who, who makes that determination? Um, I, it, I think at the point that you would be at that level would be a worldwide recognition that people would know you because you're not just uh, in one place that never see, is, is seen by anybody else, and especially nowadays uh, through so many different means. But, you know, uh, Alicia Alonzo, uh, Makarova, uh, Pavlova, um, uh, Platsitskaya, those are names that are in that upper, upper echelon. Um, men, on the other hand, are not uh, referred to as ballerinas, but, uh, and I, some of you remember George Verdak when he was here, um, our secretary at the ballet uh, asked him one day, he said, well, you know, Mr. V, as we called him, Mr. V, I keep getting these phone calls at, at the desk, what, you know, to the, to the ballet, and I answer, and they say, well, you know, what do you call male dancers? And he said, well, tell them that sometimes they call them ballerinos, but not very often. <laughs> So that's always been the most fun and the sense of his humor too. So ballerinos is it could be the male version of, of ballerina, but but not usually. Um, dancer again going into a French uh, version of uh, and premier dancer would be their upper levels to would be comparable to the to the prima ballerinas. So they have their own and it's just a, a simple uh, acknowledgement of, of the gender. Uh, the male and the female. Um, choreographers, different terms, those that, that go into those that, that are staging the ballets uh, would be a repetitor. Those that are actually creating the ballets are choreographers. Um, directors of companies then have very uh, uh, job descriptions, depends on what their company is, um, whether they're casting the ballet, they're choreographing the ballet, or, or they're just setting up the season and hiring other people in to come in and do that. Now it is gone from the court to uh, a business. It is the business of the art. An interesting thing, though, when you think of, the, of de' Medici actually coming and being that, um, that financier of the art form, it still has to have somebody that, that creates it, that pays for that creation, that does the, the support, the financial support. Um, it was then, and it still is. It's just who, who is doing that, who is um, supporting that. Um, you know, a couple of the other costume things here as we go through, through p time periods here, and we talked about the, uh, the shortening of the skirts and the romantic period and the romantic tutus here. Also, the soft shirts for the, for the poet, for that romantic look, had a, a softer f uh, quality than just the jacket. So again, you almost can imagine this shirt being under this jacket, and you say, you know what, we're going to start shedding layers. And so I can move a little easier, I can uh, see the muscle working, I can see the arm moving, I can see all of that in, a, in less of a covered costume, if you will. Still there's that, that sense that this could be a prince, that this could be someone of court nobility or of station. Um, and again, this is, this is not going to be the prince in Cinderella's costume, but it could be. Could be the uh, Swan Lake, it could be Sleeping Beauty, it could be any number of things, but you have that traditional sort of uh, period look in the costuming. And then it gradually shortened to the point where it, uh, this is a little bit of a, um, a version of a classical tutu. And then of course here's the, the bodice on top of that. 
This happens to be out of a very stretchy fabric, lycra fabric, but uh, without the boning I spoke of earlier, the corset type of boning. So this has a lot of flexibility, but it really can hug the body nicely. And then even on top, we have some stretch in that bosque area of it before you get to the skirt. But the shortened skirt allows, again, the maximum view of the leg possible. And then you can shorten this skirt a little bit and flatten it out with a hoop, which uh, again, originally was um, uh, uh, a wire hoop that you would put in that skirt to lay it flat out like a pancake sometimes. You'll see that in this kind of a tutu that's very short, uh, uh, or, uh, very um, flat so you can see the leg. And that's uh, again, an, uh, an aesthetic choice of what you're trying to go for. Um, usually that happens for some practical reasons too. Um, if you're doing something as a principal dancer where you have a partner who needs to come up and try to find where your balance point is on one toe or one tip of one toe, on five toes, tip of one shoe, um, it's very difficult to do that when you have something in the way. Um, it's basically trying to drive blind or with blinders on. It's very difficult. So the, f the, the shorter the tutu, the flatter it is, the more chance that you're going to at least peripherally be able to see where that point of balance is on the, on the person that you're trying to support and create uh, a, an, an, um, a look of, of effortlessness. Um, then, of course, after this, um, we take the tutu off completely and go into just soft skirts. Um, we can do something that's very contemporary with, with some a soft skirt that really gives maximum use of, of, of maximum visibility of leg. Um, and then sometimes even like with the quintessential balancing ballet where they're just in, in practice clothes, leotards and tights. And uh, one of the early stories is that because the costumes weren't done or they didn't arrive in time for the first production, they just decided to go in practice clothes and that became the rage. So very often, the, the, you, you turn, turn that into something that now becomes the norm in a lot of ways. Um, so yeah, we've got some, uh, some resources now that uh, you know, we can all access. Certainly the libraries have a lot of, of uh, DVDs, a lot of things are available for viewing, reading, a lot of books are still out there on, on dance, uh, as well as online services and things that you can see a lot of YouTube clips and uh, see dance in a lot of ways. Uh, some really, really lovely things uh, that are available, uh, historic as well as contemporary. Um, it's very interesting that uh, there was a production, a new Russian production of uh, Coppelia that, that had some really, really interesting designs. You could sit and watch almost the entire thing. I think they had it split up into three separate acts if you're willing to sit for about 40 minutes and watch through that. But you know, the nice thing is you can always um, pause that or come back to it. But again, we're missing the live action of it if we, if we just rely on that. I think, just like tonight, we're talking about something that will interest you to come to experience it live. And that's really what the, the most of the art forms are about. Recordings are great, films are great, but to come to theater to experience the live and um, that fresh and spontaneous and the, the real humanness of a live orchestra accompanying uh, a stage full of live dancers, dancing, performing, doing something they've rehearsed for some period of time, and um, always working toward perfection. But knowing because it's a human art form, there's going to be something that's not perfect every time. And sometimes we come to see, well, what are they gonna do with that? We know that wasn't, if my eye is tuned in, I can see that that wasn't maybe exactly right, but what are they gonna do to fix it? We almost cheer them on, if you will, to see how the human body can overcome some uh, less than ideal human uh, possibilities there. So um, I want to invite people up uh, who would like to, to come up and, and try a couple exercises or positions here at the bar. I see some folks brought their ballet slippers. Uh, you can do that or in your sneakers. Again, we've got enough floor traction here. But anybody who would like to come up and uh, try a few exercises here at the bar. Uh, we do some of our positions. Uh, if you're not comfortable doing that, you're welcome to just stay and watch the observation of, of uh, those of us that are up here doing this. And then we'll get back to some time for Q&A. And I wanna give you a, 
uh, closing uh, bit of wrap up here in a few minutes about, uh, again, I've been talking and alluding to Cinderella, but I'll tell you a little bit more about that here as we go. So you want to come join me up here? <laughs> oh, come on up. We got a, you're just going to be the first one. The first one. We got a few others. And we got a couple bars here too. So, so come on up. So we talked about the, the rotation of the leg that comes from the hip socket. Uh, it, it doesn't come from the floor. It comes from the center. Um, the center is a lot more talked about in modern dance because um, so often the center wasn't as, as thought of as, as that important because you were being supported by your corseted boned bodice and you didn't have to really zero in on that, but you really do. And so everything has to come from there out. So the rotation comes from the hip socket, the leg rotation, um, so that we can move sideways easier than if we were trying to do step over, like a, some sort of a grapevine step, so, or turn this direction and walk. We do, we do the sideways, so we turn our leg out, rotating it outward. Some people sometimes get confused and have the feet going this direction, but that would be hard to, to move one way or the other. So you know, it is a matter of putting your heels to get your heel and your toe into your heel and your toe is a, a fifth position. But we start with our first position, which is basically rotating your feet as far out as they can, and then gradually for the rest of your life, you continue trying to rotate that more and more and more. A combination of gaining flexibility and gaining strength. And as we all know, when we start gaining strength, we can get a little bit muscle bound. If all we're doing is flexibility and we have no strength to hold ourselves, you know, we have to find a happy balance in there. So in first position, we just keep our arms down to the sides, nice rounded position and shape. Again, you can imagine having a large enough costume on that you wouldn't be able to bring your arms straight down and hug them by your side. You have to keep it rounded and, and, and uh, a curved shape that's, that's uh, aesthetically pleasing. And if you take your arms out to the side and take your um, feet out to the side, that's your second position. And again, it's, it's uh, like you're just hugging a large ball so that it keeps it right out and away from your sternum with elbows lifted and palms basically facing toward each other here. And then if you want to bring them in from second position to third position, you just take your heel to your instep or heel right at the arch there. And that's your third position. Again, all the time rotating to your, to your maximum. We can bring our arms down. Fourth position has two different, two different ones. Again, school of thought. Do you slide it straight forward opposite your third? Or do you cross it over a little bit so that you can go from there, pull it back into fifth position where your toe and your heel on each side of your foot are together. So that is a straight leg that you pull it in fifth position. So you go back to first position and out to second position. Third position, we'll bring our arms down to Amba. Fourth position, and then pull it right back into fifth position. And there are your fifth, five positions of, of the feet. And from there, all other choreography uh, emanates. Um, it's, it's, like an, it's like 26 letters in the alphabet create all the words in the language. Five positions in, in, at the bar create all of the things that from which we you know, see all of the dance steps that go from there. But we do things at the bar, you know, we may start with a tondu combination, trying to getting the leg a little bit moving, just getting the kinks out in the morning first thing. Or we might go right into plies, where we would do uh, a demi or a, a shallow or a half plie. Or we might do one that's grand, a big, a large, where we take it all the way down, which is a little tough in jeans, more than I thought they would be. <laughs> but that works, OK? So again, it's not a matter of dropping your heels off, but trying to keep the heels down so the backs of the legs get as deep of a stretch as possible. You, know, you can see people doing their hurdler stretch. They do, the, do different things, to trying to stretch their calves out, trying to stretch the backs of the legs out. Same sort of thing, it's just in a different position. It happens to be, I'm trying to stretch the back of my leg, my Achilles, my calf, by going into this position where I tr drop the knees over the feet. And then if I go further down, I still try to keep my heels down as long as possible so I'm getting as good and deep a stretch as possible. And then at the very last moment, let the heels come off and as soon as possible, get them back in contact to the floor. So that way we're not, if you can see, that it's not going into this type of a position where we go down and then we leave our heels off and we come up and then roll over it where it becomes this sort of inverted. But we try to go down and then reverse that by pushing the heels down back through demi plie and then back. So it's a progression through those positions and then back through the positions in reverse. Should look like the same thing going forward and backward if you filmed it, right? And then of course you can go up to a demi point, as we said earlier, 
but you go up to a, a half a point, which is to the, to the, as fully stretched as high as you possibly can, holding the bar or holding your center. And then, of course, if you can go further and beyond and up onto the point of your, or the tip of your toe, the point of your foot, you can then do that. But then you come back through that. That's that position, too. From there, when you're jumping, then you're going to try to have that demi point position that you jump through to a fully stretched foot. You're coming back through the fully stretched foot to the demi point before you then land the heels. We try not to jump up in the air and flex our feet and come back down with a flat foot. Makes it a little hard on the spine, makes it a little harder on your um, wisdom teeth, and it makes it a little hard for the audience to see it because it's very jarring. So, what you're trying to do is make it smooth and effortless. And sometimes that seems too dainty, that seems maybe too too refined. Some people want it to be a little more crude. Some people want it to be a little bit more real and gutsy. And so that's, a, that's where different dance forms come from this. Like, I don't want to have to jump and land through my foot. I want to land with a big cl clump and clump and roll on the floor and things. And that's fine if that's, you know, if that's what you so desire to do. So we've got the basic positions of demi plie, grand plie. And you can do those in every position. We try not to do too much too soon. We gradually work through it so the body is warmed up. And then we do a series of, of movements called tendu, whether we're taking them to the front or to the side or to the back, you know, devant, a la seconde, derrière. Again, using the French whenever possible so that you've got that. And, you, and once you've done one exercise on one side, usually with the left hand on the bar to start with, then we go to the other side. You turn toward the bar and you go and do the same exercise on the other side with the other hand on the bar. Then you come back, tr keep turning back and forth, just kind of uh, creating a stitch here, and then go on to the next exercise, and then do it on the other side, and then go on to the third exercise, and do it on both sides, so that you're always balanced and even and equal, and all the time trying to challenge yourself. And again, it, all, it still continues to keep coming back to the point of balance, whether it's on one foot, or whether it's on two feet, whether you try to balance up, and sometimes I like doing this one, uh, because you realize how sensitive we can be the body, but we're taking, we're going to all go up onto demi point here, so, and from this point, you find your balance without the bar, so you can, whether you're, wherever your arms are, and then gently close your eyes. Oh my gosh, it, we are so dependent on sight, and so when we were working this year with the School for the Blind and Visually Impaired and bringing them Martha Graham Dance, realizing that you don't have to, but when you do have your sight and you take that away, we realize we're, we, we have so depended on our sight to, for our balance rather than our center. And what it does, it's another form of an exercise. If you can balance with your eyes closed, then, then you're really going to be solid and strong and, and balanced whether your op their eyes are opened or closed. And some, ba some pieces may call it for your role to have you have your eyes closed. Maybe you're uh, in doing sonambula. You're going to have to look like the sleepwalker. So you can't have your eyes open. You have to be able to do the whole dance with the eyes closed. So sometimes it's, it comes into practical terms and things. But that is a way to challenge. And so that the dance, whether it's turned out, whether it's turned in, whether it's ballet or modern or contemporary dance, it has that same basic foundation that we all get back to. And that, I think, is, is universal for all of us, whatever we're doing, whether we're going to yoga class or we're going to, to uh, step aerobics or we're going to you know, work on the recumbent bike. It's a matter of holding ourselves and trying to keep pushing our own physical, physical bodies while we're in them to those limits that we have. All right, so what questions do we have in our few mo remaining moments that we did get? I've got one here in the front row. Uh-huh, uh-huh, yes. Oh, there we go, and, yes. And during uh -huh. the Boston Marathon, yes. she was completely damaged. Oh, my. And um, I believe she lost um, the bottom of maybe both legs. Yes. And now she is incredible. She is working through a, a, a computer program mm -hmm. that has been set up by MIT. Oh, my. And she's coming back. Yes. And she's going to be able yes. To, yes. to dance again. Yes. And, uh, you know, there, oh, there's certain so things she won't be able to do. But 
and and I think that you know to that end, I think of the I, mean, I don't know her name, but she is uh, an Olympic athlete, Paralympic. Yeah. That's that's on Dancing with the Stars, yeah. and I think you know it's back to that point of always progressing through. The next generation is going to come up with a way. And we've, I mean, there are several of us here in the audience who have lived through the point where you, there were no Paralympics. You, you were, you were, you, there was no, that was it. You, if you lost your limb or you, you know, had that kind of, of disability, you didn't have options to now know that you do and with, with technology that you can create other things and you can actually have a very viable, I mean, and clearly she's not, at first we weren't sure about her. Is she going to be able to do this? Are we going to feel sorry for her? What, are, what is our public perception? I mean, she's a contender. She is a good dancer. She has the soul of a dancer. So she's not going to be just doing this because um, we need to have a, a different kind of uh, uh, attention to the program, so we're going to get, you know, give that to her. She really is a dancer. Just because she doesn't have her legs doing the dancing doesn't mean she shouldn't be dancing and can't dance. So for this lady, it's a grand, it gives a great hope and, and a great, uh, I think it really, we, we're seeing how we're shifting into the next generation of what's, what's dance going to be? What, is, what does it mean to be a dancer? And, you know, what does it mean to be um, physical disability or handicapped that, that's, that changes that definition in, in beautiful ways? Yes, 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 exactly, yes. The Olympic athlete's a prime example of that, yes. We have another question somewhere here, anybody? I think we have, oh, one right here in the back. Yes. They were something oh, like oh. dart, jump, leap, hop, like that. Yes. Do you know them? Yeah, the I, seven? Do, I, I don't without oh, looking okay. those up. No, but that's, <laughs> but that, but yes, there, it's, it's again that school of thought of, of uh, really f uh, uh, whittling it down or fine tuning what the actual movements are, the directions of the body that they are, those positions. You know, again, you think, okay, five positions, why isn't it six or seven? You know, it could be, it could be, you could throw another couple in there, right? I mean, why don't we have a, I mean, and, and technically, there is now what we call a sixth position with dance, with ballet. It's, it's taking fifth position and turning it parallel. So there is your sixth, sixth position. Now, it's, Exactly, exactly. It's just, it's together, it's parallel, it's, it's working in that, in that position. But again, that, this is very difficult to work sideways unless you cross over. So that's why we have that, in, in, for the most part, in classical forms. But, but again, as dance evolves, you have that descriptions of what ways the body is moving in those same s seven basic ways in which you're speaking of there. Yeah. Got another question up here, let's see. Listening to what you just said, I read it somewhere, but don't quote me. Is it American Ballet Company mm -hmm. that they don't use one of, the, remember there's a five basic one, they don't use the fourth? There usually third. Or the third or something third like position, that. Yeah, third position usually isn't used. It's usually first, second, fourth, and fifth. But whenever we're doing this kind of, a, of an exercise, we go through that so you can see that there is a third position there. It's not usually used. It's, it's more of a demi-character type of position, so I might use this if I'm the king in Sleeping Beauty, or if I'm walking around and I might put my feet together here just to pull them together to give you a, a sense of, of, of stability and weight underneath yourself. So it's really more of a, of a carriage and a character thing. But that is an important part of the ballets. You know, as we, again, we wrap it up by saying we started off with this spectacle about uh, presenting these you know, wonderful mythological stories or some, some beautiful uh, pageants and then that became much more of a storytelling type of vehicle. Dance really still, when it comes down to it, is about the body trying to bring the music to life. And the music, of course, is, is a composer's idea of a story in, this, in our sense. You know, it's not always that literal, and, and certainly some choreographers go with a story-less ballet, um, but, but traditionally they were coming about and trying to tell a story, and that requires some character dancers, some, some, some more natural moving dancers, as well as the trained classical dancers, and then some character dancers, um, who basically are the, the pantomime storytellers of the, of, the, of the production, because it's usually done without any voice. Even though early productions were a combination of opera and dance, um, it, it's pretty much traditionally now just tell the story without words, tell the story with, with how you gesture and how you move through space 
and what kind of pretty pictures we're creating with the scenery and the costumes and all of that. Which also explains why you see sometimes in one production, you'll see romantic length tutus, classical tutus, maybe some soft skirts, uh, a variety of different things because of the, of the range in which they're trying to tell the story through their, their different uh, characters. Um, I wanted to wrap it up with a um, uh, mention again that uh, Butler Ballet Cinderella is coming up here on Friday through Sunday, the 25th through the 27th, there are three shows, Friday and Saturday night and Sunday matinee. And uh, it is with live uh, orchestra, so all of this area out here actually uh, you can see where the, the first box seats are. That's uh, how far out the orchestra will go. So it's a very large space for them to be. So the performers, where you all are right here, in, on basically on center stage here, uh, has, have a great distance to project your dance and to really perform out to that audience. So hopefully you'll be here. And if um, you want and you not have your uh, tickets purchased yet, you can use tonight's ticket, present that at the box office, to receive $10 off your Cinderella ticket. So you can use that for coming tonight. We want to thank you all for that. And as a token of our appreciation, we want you to, to bring a friend and come see, come see live ballet. And um, to just uh, to really kind of share uh, what you've learned tonight with your friends and uh, to bring them to the ballet. And hopefully when you come, you'll have a better understanding of what's going on and appreciation, and we can continue that dialogue as in future conversations. So thank you all very much. I appreciate it. Very good.